And like a, when a new phone comes, you know, people just, there are websites just crash because so many people want to buy the phone. Yes, it may have some new features, but you know, it's not something which is uh, so desperately life transforming. But people just get crazed by it because it's all driven by the hope that you know, by getting some new things, by making some new adjustments, my life will become better. That is the driving force of science. Science can be a quest for knowledge, but science as it exists today is not so much a quest for knowledge as a quest for power. Knowledge is there in it, but the knowledge is meant to gain power. Power to control nature, power to make nature bend to our will. So it's karma. So parallel with this triumphalist march of modern science, were these existentialist, nihilist philosophers who felt that life is just meaningless. So they of course also were atheistic. Science also in one way, uh, through its technological promises, led people away from God. But religion, but these, these existentialist philosophers, they also led people away from God, but in a different way. So Frederick Nietzsche, he said that actually, Existence is miserable. It is best if we were not born only. But if we are born, it is best if we die early. There's another thing, Albert Camus, he said that actually life is just misery. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. And his conclusion was commit it tomorrow. Live today. He wrote tomes of books. They just fill with so much negativity, so much pessimism. So in both cases, what has happened? Karma and Jnana, as they existed in the Vedic times. And Karma and Jnana, as they exist now. By Karma, I mean actions which we do in this world. Jnana, I refer to contemplation, introspection, analysis. In both Karma and Jnana, in the Vedic times, and we would say that this is not just the Vedic times. If you look at thinkers all over the world, there have been people who have thought that, okay, by working we'll make things better. And there are people who thought and try to detach themselves. Both schools of thought are there in all, in all systems of thought. You know, in all religions also, we can see strands of karma and we can see strands of jnana. Mm. So these are not just religiously specific parts. They are universal human frames of thinking and acting. So anyway, the main difference between karma and jnana as it existed in the past, in the Vedic path, and as it exists now, is that the modern times are very strongly characterized by the rejection of any world beyond this world. In fact, this is, if you consider the time, this pre-modern times, there are modern times, there are post-modern times. The defining difference between modern times and post-modern and pre-modern times is not just that science advanced, but the defining difference in the mainstream intellectual ethos was that in the modern times, the hope of any world beyond this world was just rejected as religious sentimental mythology. And then, when the hope of another world is rejected, what happens? See, the human heart naturally longs for something more than what the world can offer. It is the same people who say, if we on Narasimha Chandra Dashi, we Lord Lord, worship Lord Narasimha Dev, say he's half man, half loyal. And skeptics will say, I don't believe in such mythology. How can there be a half man, half lawyer? They'll reject that. But then those same people will watch cartoons where there's a half man and a half bat. Or there's a half man and a half spider. Hmm? Or sometimes there's a half man and a half bat and half spider combined together. All kinds of things. So now what has happened over here? And it's not just that small children watch this kind of comics. Even adults watch it. And again, they use the best of technology to make movies and cartoons and to animate and do fiction with this. So actually, attraction to the paranormal, attraction
reaction to the supernatural. That means that which is beyond what we observe in this world. So attraction to the paranormal is normal to the human heart. The human heart wants something more than the prosaic reality that this world offers us. And when we reject the idea of any higher world as is described by the religious traditions of the world, as is described by the spiritual wisdom texts of the world, then we create our own imaginations. <coughs> so, <coughs> people just dress themselves up. Say for example, when the Harry Potter series was released, people just become maniac about it. They just dress themselves in that particular way and they imagine that they, they have dramas, they have movies and this and that. People, everybody wants to enter into some world which is different from the world which we exist in. So this, could, so this is the normal human level of reality, existence. What the scriptures tell us is that a higher existence is spiritual existence. But this has been rejected by the modern worldview. And whether it is by the thoughts or strands of karma or the strands of jnana. Then what happens? People imagine a world. And they try to dissolve themselves in that world. In fact, the whole concept of video games the whole concept of entertainment in terms of movies, the whole concept in terms of sports. Now, entertainment, sports have always been there in history. But the kind of compulsiveness, the mania with which people get gripped, that is unprecedented. You know, people sometimes, when a favorite team loses, there are riots. They just become violent. There are in India, in the Indian subcontinent, cricketers. A mania. So, uh, Sri Lanka is a country which four finals it went to and four times it lost. So after it lost the fourth time, several Sri Lankans committed suicide. For no reason, it's because their team lost. So what has happened? Entertainment is a fact of life. It has always been there throughout history. Sports have also been there throughout history. But the kind of compulsive mania which is associated with entertainment and sports nowadays, that is because people desperately need some reality apart from the reality that we experience at the mundane level. And then they want to escape into that reality through sports, through entertainment, through movies, through video games, and nowadays through the internet. So with virtual reality coming up, it's becoming more and more alluring. But ultimately, it is false, it is temporary, it doesn't fulfill the heart. So karma, so, so all these sports, movies, uh, virtual reality, simulations, all these are basically manifestations of karma, by which people want to do some actions by which they can make life better for themselves. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Eha bahaya. all this is external. None of this is going to satisfy the heart. And actually, the same applies. So I mean, I'm talking that the defining difference between karma and jnana in the Vedic times and in modern times is that a hope of a higher world is rejected. Now, I talk about how this leads in the path of karma to people maniacally going into some imaginary world. Now, in the path of jnana. Jnana means contemplation. If there is contemplation without the hope for a higher world, then it just leads to desperation, frustration, depression. It just leads to hopelessness. And that's what happens to most philosophers who seriously think. Yes, they think and in this world we look at it objectively, it is a place of distress. And if we analyze objectively, we can understand that no matter how many things I do to improve, things are not going to ultimately improve. So it just leads to so much despair. So if there is, if 20th century philosophy, if it had any one defining characteristic, it was despair. Just despair. Life is meaningless. Life is meaningless. What is the use of living? And thereafter, 
what has happened philosophy is now just largely become about semantics you know trying to analyze the meanings of words trying to analyze the meaning of symbols philosophy as it exists today in academia is hardly a search for the truth so because they just thought there is no truth ultimately so karma and jnana if both of them are divorced from the understanding of a higher world then they both lead to greater illusion one illusion can be a maniac hope for improvement in uh, illusory ways and another can be just a maniac desperation this desperation nothing a thing is worth it so eh bahya age kaha chaitanya mahaprabhu he says all this is external in the vedic context gyana as was present was that if one studies scripture if one becomes more introspective one will understand that things in this world are temporary and one will become detached so gyana in the past led to vairagya but gyana as it exists today especially when i talk about gyana in terms of scientific knowledge it doesn't lead to any vairagya it simply leads to greater raga it leads to greater attachment greater hope for enjoying the world greater ways in which people and see if you study scripture too much then you will become detached and my elder son vishwaru has already renounced the world this younger son may also renounce the world so let him stop studying scripture the idea was gyana leads to vairagya so neither gyana not nor karma can actually satisfy the human heart certainly gyan and vaira gyan and karma as they exist in today's world where they are divorced from any hope of any higher reality they can never lead to fulfillment no matter how much science progresses no matter how much technology brings wizardry it is not going to bring fulfillment to the human heart technology may bring comforts to people's lives but people will end up being comfortably unhappy people will be comfortably unhappy you know we see that nowadays there is so much especially in the western world there is so much comforts physically even if it's hot or cold whether it's freezing cold or it's burning heat if we are in our houses in our offices we don't even realize it but even in our houses in our offices there is so much stress there are family conflicts there are office politics there is job insecurity so people are comfortable but they are comfortably miserable they're not comfortably happy so we may be able to get some comforts for some time through science so through technology but that's not going to lead to any improvement so eha bahya but not just karma and gyana divorced from the spiritual context from a, the hope of a higher world but even karma and gyana as they existed in the past where they were connected with the hope of a higher world chaitanya mahaprabhu says even they are bahya even they are external Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Swami Thakur, one of the first books he wrote was Bengali Samaji Kita, uh, society, sociality in Bengal, and he compares Indian and Western civilization at that time. And this was the time Bhakti Siddhanta Swami Thakur was he started becoming active in the 19th, uh, early part of the 20th century. He founded Gaudiya Math in 1919. We started writing from 1904, 1905 onwards, primarily. So this was the time in the Bengal, what was called as the Bengal Renaissance, was at its peak. So we had a European Renaissance in the in the 16th, 17th centuries. In India, it came in the 1920th centuries. So this was basically the the pre-modern worldview of a civilization changed to a modern worldview. So that happened in Europe in the 16th, 17th centuries. In Euro- India, it happened in the 1920th centuries. In the Islamic world, it has never happened. and that's why islam is often very strongly in conflict with the modern world but the point is when this happened he wrote a bakshan chakur wrote a very insightful essay he says that the western people think that the indians are so lazy so apathetic so fatalistic that you know, india hardly ever developed any science and technology yes there was science and technology of its own kind but not of the modern kind so he says indians are not at all interested in progress that that of the criticism of western people and bhakti sanjay thakur says that actually we have karmendriyas and we have gyanendriyas and he says that the western definition of progress 
is based on karmendriyas. Karmendriyas means knowledge, echo, action, doing senses. So the more we can act effectively with our senses, that is the definition of progress. So we can ride on bicycles, we can fly in planes, we can go in spacecrafts, then we think we have progress. But he said that in the Vedic civilization, progress was defined not in terms of expertise in karmendriyas, but expertise in jnanendriyas. That in observing the world, in understanding the nature of the world, and then that observation can either lead to renunciation of the world, or it can lead to redirection of the heart towards the Lord. So those who focused more on observing and analyzing and understanding the nature of the world, their definition of progress was in terms of looking for something beyond this world. Whereas those who focused on karmendriyas, their focus was on doing things in this world. And he says that's why, because the basic operating paradigm is different, that's why and the Western mind cannot appreciate the progress that the Indian mind has done in terms of spiritual understanding. Because their definition itself is very different. So when we practice bhakti also, now even I was born and brought up in India, but I was also born and brought up in a Western education. So what happens is we often see things in the perspective of this world. Bhakti contributes in this world also. Bhakti makes our life better in this world also, but that is not the defining characteristic of bhakti. Bhakti's primary purpose is to take us beyond this world. Yes, if we practice bhakti, we live more harmoniously with Krishna, our life in this world will also be better. But that is not the sole criteria for deciding the value of bhakti. Because no matter how much life becomes better at the material level, it's never going to be fulfilled and bhakti where a progression. The same brahmanas, who did rituals? Oh, you know, your father, you are you are uh, you're not getting a good bounty, do the sacrifice. Do this yagya and you'll get it. You're not getting a child, no, do this yagya, you'll get a child. So the, the Brahmanas had the potency by which they could do yagyas, by which they could fulfill people's desires. And by this, people develop faith. Oh, whatever these Brahmanas are saying makes sense. And then Gradually, people would progress from karma to jnana. Then the same Vedic literature, which talk about karma kanda, which talk about doing rituals for making life better, they also talk about detaching yourself from the world. Oh, okay, the same books have said this. I, I, let me hear, let me understand this. And the same books culminate ultimately in bhakti, where they say that we don't just have to detach ourselves from the world, we have to actually attach ourselves to Krishna. And then people are interested in that also. So there's a progression. Karma, Jnana and Bhakti are all meant to be progressively elevating the human consciousness. But even in the Vedic times, they got divorced. What was meant to be progressive became competitive. So there were exponents of Karma who considered Karma itself to be ultimate. There were exponents of Jnana who considered Jnana itself to be ultimate. And there were a few exponents of Bhakti who established how bhakti is the ultimate. <clears throat> so when karma and jnana become competitive to bhakti, then they are rejected. See, this is not what we are meant to do. So karma, when it becomes competitive, that means that one gets so caught in religious rituals that one forgets the purpose of those rituals. This is what happened in the 10th canto to the, as is described, to the yagyic brahmanas. They were caught so much in doing rituals that they were doing a yagya, but the yagyeshwar Krishna himself sent his representatives. But they paid no attention. They got too much caught in the letters. In the letter, we could say the letter of the law. In the rituals. And they forgot what was the purpose. So such karma, where one gets too caught in ritual religiosity, is neglect, is, is not accepted by the uh, bhakti exponents. Similarly, jnana, if it becomes too over-analytical, then also it just focuses on analyzing this world and rejecting the world. And then that over-analytical mode, even when we come to God, we analyze Him and we think we have to go beyond Him also. So what happens? Jnana, if it helps us to look beyond this world to something higher, that is good. And that Brahmavad is one form of impersonalist thought.
monistic thought, which involves going beyond the duality, the variety of this world, to look at the oneness of the absolute. And that form of impersonalism is good. But when the analytical, strat analytical mentality becomes excessive, then one not only analyzes and dismisses the world, but one applies that to God also. He says you have to go beyond God also. So Mayavad is a form of impersonalism which says not only is this world Maya, they say even Krishna is Maya. And you have to go beyond Krishna also. So when this happens, when Jnana becomes excessive, when one gets too much caught in Jnana, then one ends up missing the point of Jnana, that is Krishna. And this is what Jyotan Mahaprabhu repeatedly points out. So before this eighth chapter in the Madhya Leela, there's a sixth chapter, but Jyotan Mahaprabhu transforms Sarvam Bhattacharya, where he has got caught in Jnana and he's just forgotten that the purpose of analysis is ultimately to surrender to the Lord. But when you keep analyzing, analyzing, and one analyzes away the Lord also. So that is unfortunate. So karma and jnana ultimately are meant to culminate in bhakti. <coughs> and bhakti, as was explained by Srila Prabhupada, was not just a sentiment. Prabhupada says in the Nectar of Instruction, uh, he says, devotional service is not some sentimental ecstasy, sentimental ecstasy or some imaginative emotion. He says, its substance is practical activity. So bhakti, it involves the heart, definitely. But the heart is, is not just to be divorced from the head and the hands. They're all to be used. So there are rituals in bhakti also. But the rituals have a purpose. Those rituals are meant to help us move towards Krishna. And we come in through the deities, we bow down to the deities. The bowing down helps us to create a mood of humility. So what we do with the hands, the hands are a metaphor for the body, uh, what we do with the hands is important. It shapes our consciousness. You know, if I just sit back like this and I raise my hand, legs up and I say, I am feeling very humble now. <laughs> well, I might be, but it's very difficult. That same, that same posture itself creates a bossy mentality. So our externals do shape our internals. So the process of bhakti involves that we engage our hands, that is our body, in a way that it is conducive to the awakening of the heart. And similarly, bhakti involves using our head. Using our head in a way that involves awakening of our heart. So we use our hands to do rituals. But the difference between karmakanda rituals and the bhakti rituals. In the karmakanda rituals, we do various actions and hope that by these actions, life will become better. Things will become better in this world. But when we devotees do actions, yes, we may also, there are problems, we may try to solve those problems. And we need to do that as a responsibility. But our primary purpose, whenever we do our actions in bhakti, is not just to change things externally. It is to change things internally. When we do actions in bhakti, the primary purpose is that we want to purify ourselves. We want to serve Krishna and purify ourselves. In Prabhupada Lila, Satsuru Maharaj writes that when Prabhupada came to America in the early days, 1965-66, he was completely alone. And you know, he was just walking alone, alone in New York uh, streets. He could seem desolate. He could seem to be a failure. Nothing, had, Nobody had come at that time. He had been there for five, six months. Nobody committed had come. He said, but, but from Krishna's perspective, Prabhupada was already successful. Because even in America, he was doing the activities of bhakti. He was connected with Krishna. He was speaking to whoever came. He was writing his Bhagavatam purports, recording his Bhagavatam purports. He was still absorbed in Krishna. So in bhakti also, when we do karma, if our focus is too much on external results, and the external results will not come, we will think, what is the use of doing this? In bhakti, we have to be clear. Our purpose, we want to get the external results, but that is not our purpose. Our purpose is to get, a, get the inner result. By doing that service in a mood of devotion, we get internally connected with Krishna. If through that service, externally also more and more people get connected with Krishna, that's wonderful. But that's not the primary purpose. So that's the, so the intention is the defining difference in how devotees do activity and how at the level of karma activity is done. 
and jnana also the beautiful section uh, given by rupa Gos by jiva goswami in his shat sandarbhas he talks about what is the difference between jnana as is practiced by understood by jnanis and jnana as understood by the bhaktas so he says that jnanis their purpose in jnana is to understand the oneness of the atma and the brahman aham brahmasmi so their purpose of jnana is to understand that i am one with god now it is true we are one with god in the sense that god is spiritual we are spiritual <laughs> in the process of bhakti however the purpose of jnana is not so much to understand the oneness of the atma with brahman the purpose of jnana is to understand the greatness of krishna so in a sense we want to understand the difference between us and krishna i am so tiny krishna is so great <coughs> and then with this purpose we study scripture then the then that knowledge that jnana actually leads to increased submission to krishna increased a devotion to krishna oh krishna is so great so this is so devotees study scripture monis study scriptures devotees can also be intellectuals impersonals can also be intellectuals but there is a big difference in intention it both the impersonalists and the devotees are looking for something beyond the world unlike the karmis who are trying to make things better in this world but the when looking beyond the world the gyani is their focus is to think that i want to become one with that absolute and i want to realize intellectually how i am one with the absolute whereas the devotee their understanding is yes the absolute is beyond this world i am also beyond this world but in that absolute world there is not just oneness there is there is ecstasy there is joyfulness that comes from the reciprocation of love and in that reciprocation of love there is actually mm, Uh, there is uh, the greatness of krishna and the smallness of the jiva so often mm, whenever there are relationships the people want to have equality nowadays you know if uh, any relationship is there we should be all equal so bhakti actually rejoices in inequality in understanding how great krishna is and how small we are this theme i'll talk in tomorrow's class more how actually it is not inequality because krishna elevates his devotees but still bhakti centers bhakti is actually you can say it is a process is a path of ecstatic inequality <laughs> normally we say inequality is bad i want to be equal with others but bhakti is the more we understand krishna's greatness the more we become absorbed in him that actually brings ecstasy to the human heart so bhakti is the path of ecstatic inequality So I'll summarize. Covered a lot of territory today. So I start the theme which I focused on was how bhakti inverts the social hierarchy. That normally brahmanas are the they are the guardians of religious truth and they consider everyone as outsiders. But here Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanandra are hugging each other, and the brahmanas are outsiders. They can't understand the mellows of spiritual emotion that they are relishing. and the bhagavatam also talks time and time again through rutrasuri uh, indra ex example through ambarish maharaj pariksha uh, and durasman example and through the gopis example of how when somebody has bhakti then even if socially they are considered lower they become the devotees become higher and uh, i talked about the conventional hierarchy that was there karma jnana and bhakti and this is not just within specific categories within the vedic literature they are also universal human ways of thinking and acting so karma centers on the idea that by actions we will make this world a better place so karma is focused on hands doing practical actions jnana focuses on contemplation this world is a place of misery i just have to go beyond this world so it's more function of the head detach oneself bhakti is a function of the heart where we redirect our heart towards the lord and we use our hands and our head in aiding that redirection <clears throat> and i talked about how this mentality of karma and jnana is present in the modern world also 
Science, although it involves much uh, intellectual theorizing and other things, still it's not jnana, it's karma, because it is driven by the hope that scientific knowledge will give us technological power by which we can make life better in this world. So, however, the technological power uh, which promised a technological paradise as a replacement for the religious paradise offered by religion, that has not materialized. Life has, may have become comfortable, but people are comfortably miserable because the heart is dissatisfied. Just greater control, greater technology doesn't bring satisfaction to the heart. And concurrent with this, there, is, there has been jnana in the modern times also, where there are existentialists and nihilist philosophers who just observed that this world is distressful and they just became extremely pessimistic, extremely hopeless. And because of that hopelessness, the dog modern philosophy, now philosophy has just stopped looking for truth in the academic circles, just uh, juggle with semantics now, semantics and symbols. So the defining difference between modern times and pre-modern times was Pre-modern times had an understanding that there is some world beyond this world. And that is our ultimate destination. But modern times have the idea that this there's nothing beyond this world. <coughs> and even in karma, the human heart is not satisfied with the prosaic reality of this world. And attraction to the paranormal is normal. Attraction to the supernatural is natural to the human heart. And that's why those same people who reject us mythology a half man, half law, and manifestation of God, uh, they delight in a half man, half spider, superhuman being, or super being. So people, the compulsive, obsessive way in which they get into entertainment, sports, video games, movies, that is because the human heart desperately longs for some reality better than the mundane reality. So in the past, religion was meant to direct our hope higher to a higher reality. But today, technology directs it to an imaginary reality. And that doesn't satisfy. That still keeps people frustrated. So karma, which is divorced from the hope of a higher world, simply leads to greater illusion and frustration. And jnana too, which is divorced from the higher world, uh, leads, to, of course, to just hopelessness. And bhakti involves not the rejection of karma and jnana, but the harmonization in the pursuit of Krishna, in the attainment of God. So in that I discussed how devotees do activities and materialistic people do activities, karmis do. But the difference is, devotees also want to change things better so that we can serve Krishna better. But devotees' primary purpose in doing activity is not to get the change externally. It is by doing that service to get the change internally. So even if we do a service for many years and that service doesn't lead to any result in terms of externally some preaching happening, some projects improving, but internally we will go closer to Krishna through that service. And so the karma we do, but it is not with the motivation of karma. It is with the motivation of bhakti. Similarly, jnana, devotees also cultivate knowledge. The monists, their jnana is to realize one's oneness with the absolute. Uh, with the bhaktas also want to look, use jnana to look beyond this world, but that is to understand one's smallness in comparison with God's greatness and thereby to absorb oneself ecstatically in God's greatness. So bhakti is the path of ecstatic inequality, where the very smallness of the devotee in contrast with Krishna gives the devotee ecstasy by absorption in Krishna. So thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Hare Krishna. Very nice class. Thank you. Thank you. you mentioned about how we're very small, Krishna's very great. This is uh, the goal of our position is to understand the greatness and how small we are. Prabhupada mentions in one purport that the, the highest manifestation of Krishna's greatness is when he becomes subordinate to mm -hmm. his devotee. Yeah. So maybe you could speak a little bit. Like I, I was trying to speak that tomorrow. Oh, that's no, tomorrow. that's the whole thing. <laughs> okay. Our other Rani is actually That's the whole class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, you made a point at the beginning of the class that perhaps was a little bit in passing, but I, I was reflecting on it in the context of the whole class because you were bringing out that, you know, karma and gyan, activity and knowledge, 
uh, have their place in bhakti. They're, they're actually meant to be supportive of bhakti. Um, and so at the beginning of the class, you spoke about this verse where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramananda Rai are really inverting the social structure because a sannyasi Brahmin is embracing and ecstatically exchanging emotion with the Shudra Grahasta. Mm. And you were discussing, well, you mentioned briefly that this is, you know, inconceivable to those who are very fixed in the social system. And I was reflecting that actually in bhakti there is a, there is a hierarchy as well, but it's not based on social designation, it's actually based on spiritual advancement. Yeah. As we see in Chaitanya Chaitamrita in the, later in the Madhya Lila, in Jagannath Puri, when Maharaj Prataparuja is being introduced to the different devotees, there is an expression there, the Mukya Bhaktas, the chief devotees, you know, they're honoring Advaita Charya, for example, as an elder devotee, yeah. and as, a, as, a, as a, one who's advanced in his relationship with, with Mahaprabhu. Can you speak on, the, on, on this nature of, of hierarchy within bhakti, what it is and how it's different from the hierarchy mm. in the material world? Because sometimes I find that, you know, in the absence of understanding this very fine point of Vaishnav culture, one may either be rigidly attached to the social structure or uh, rigidly attached to the idea that we're all equal, this kind of false democratic idea, because that's actually mm. part of our modern idea too. But it's not really found there in bhakti in exactly the same way. Could you speak yeah. So, in bhakti also there is a hierarchy. Now, how is the hierarchy different from the hierarchy at the social level? And today we have these two schools of thought. One is that we just, uh, just rigidly stick to some hierarchies, or we just uh, blindly reject all hierarchies, and say, claim that everyone is equal. In bhakti, the essence is service attitude. Ev service attitude. Everybody wants to serve Krishna. And if we consider the five rasas, oh sorry, okay. Hare Krishna. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, all the five rasas, they are all eager to serve Krishna in different ways. Those who Shanta rasa, they, they serve Krishna just through admiration. Now, that is not a deficiency from the them, their perspective. And they just feel God is so great, what can I do for him? I can just admire his, his greatness. In Dasya Rasa, they feel that, yes, Krishna is great, but I want to do something for him. So, there is this hierarchy. Chaitanya Charitama, in the instruction, Sanatana Goswami talks about this quite detailed, how each of these has something more in the relationship. But the point is, even those in Shanta Rasa are completely satisfied. Hanuman doesn't desire that I want to be Sita because she is in a more intimate relationship with Krishna, along with Lord Ram. No, it's completely satisfied. So this is the speciality of Krishna. When we relate with Krishna, whatever position we are in, if we are connected with Krishna, Krishna can make us fully satisfied even in that position. In fact, the Gaudiya Vaishnava Siddhanta is that um, there are sakhis and there are manjaris. So when Krishna performs pastimes, uh, intimate pastimes with his sakhis, with Radha Rani, Lita, Vishakha and others. And <coughs> there are the sakhis who perform these pastimes with Krishna and there are the manjaris who observe these pastimes. So they observe how Krishna is relating with the gopis, how the gopis are relating with Krishna. Uh, Rachar has described, I'll talk more about this later, uh, if we get the time, but actually the manjaris get greater ecstasy than sakhis. They are not directly participating in Krishna Leela, they are observing. But in that, they are getting greater ecstasy. Why is that? Because the manjaris, it is said, they are able to relish the reciprocation of love from both sides. The manjaris, because they are not directly involved, they can see, oh, how much, how much Radharani loves Krishna. And they appreciate how beautiful Krishna is from Radharani's perspective. And they relish the sweetness of Radharani's, uh, uh, of Krishna as perceived by Radharani. And then, because they're observing, they can perceive from Krishna's perspective also. Now Krishna is saying how beautiful Radharani is. How much her, she has love for me. So basically, the manjuris, if you look at this appearance, then they're not participating in the past time. They're simply assistants. So in the hierarchy, we could say they're lower. But actually, they are relishing also. 
so in bhakti uh, the primary point is our connection with krishna and somebody can just be a new bhakta uh, one time i gave a class and after that one devotee came and spoke and he spoke such amazing devotional understanding from that class and i could see that you know, he really was very enriched by that class and i started thinking at that time that it can happen that sometimes a speaker may give a class and the audience may make more advancement by hearing the class than the speaker may make by speaking the class because the speaker may think oh i am so clever i am speaking such good points the speaker may not be that absorbed in krishna in a mo- in that devotional mood the speaker may be more intellectual mood you know, i have to connect this point with this point and i have to give this example it's good we are connected with krishna at that point the point is that in bhakti although for functioning either in this world or in the spiritual world okay, the material world is a replica of the spiritual world it's a distorted but it's a replica so in the spiritual world is a society and in any society there has to be some system of hierarchy mm-hmm. the hierarchy becomes discriminatory when certain people are deprived of certain things based on certain uh, considerations which are unfair then it becomes discriminatory in bhakti the primary thing is connection with krishna so there is any speaker who can speak and connect with krishna the hearers can hear and connect with krishna and sometimes the hearers may connect with krishna more than the speaker so from the external perspective the speaker is at a higher position than the hearers but from the internal perspective the hearer may be making more advancement he can hear may be more intimately connected with krishna also. so we for the purpose of functioning in a practical way hierarchies are required you know even say in societies which were supposed to be completely classless like say communism was supposed to be classless so george orwell said that you know all people are equal but some people are more equal than others <laughs> that's how it happened in communism there were the rulers and the ruled and the rulers had enormous facilities so absolute equality is not possible hmm? now <clears throat> so the other ex- the one extreme is just try to absolute equality it's not going to work there has to be some social structure which requires some hierarchy but there can be the danger there can be rigid adherence to hierarchies so if somebody is really spiritually advanced if somebody is really spiritually dedicated then we have to recognize their spiritual advancement and we have to value that we have to appreciate that and unfortunately when that was not done then that led to excessive materialism in the name of religion so if we sometimes when we come when you know india is often pursued as the land of the caste system and sometimes do people ask you know, oh are you trying to you are coming from india you are teaching indian wisdom are you trying to teach the caste system we want to reestablish that actually if we see the bhakti tradition was consistently like a inner reform movement against the caste system and most of the devotees we see they were from the lower caste and often they were persecuted by the brahmanas with the higher caste the kazi had haridas thakur beaten because the brahmanas complained against the kazi so the point which i am making is that in the tradition itself sometimes people are afraid that we don't want to deviate and we feel if we mix too much with the modern world there can be deviation this is possible the contemporary world can be a source of deviation but tradition itself can also be a source of deviation and the whole caste system which was made so rigidly stratified based only on birth that was a major deviation so if in today's world if we try to have a very rigid social hierarchy then you know we may end up not giving devotees facilities to practice bhakti so ultimately the purpose of our organization our social structure is to encourage devotees to practice bhakti so if we can have a social structure like say some form of adapted varnashram which encourages and facilitates devotees in the practice of bhakti that's wonderful but if in the name of varnashram 
we start imposing more and more obstacles for devotees to practice bhakti. No, this is not done in Varanashram, this is not done in Varanashram, this is not done in Varanashram. Well, Varanashram is meant to be a means to bhakti. Bhakti is not meant to be a means to Varanashram. So if Varanashram is favorable for bhakti, we'll accept it. So now what Varanashram means also, there's different devotees have different ideas. But I'm simply saying that, speaking this point, that social structure is, uh, is unavoidable, but we can't get so attached to social structure that it becomes an obstacle in the path of bhakti. Even within our movement, in the, early, in, the early, in the 1970s, when the devotees had formed a GBC, and Prabhupada had formed a GBC, and the GBC at one time decided that we will centralize everything. Now all finances from all temples will come to one center, and then that financial, that central body, they will decide how much funds to go to which temple. And Prabhupada was so upset by this, that Prabhupada sent a letter to all the temple presidents saying that, I have suspended the GBC now. I suspend the GBC and you just correspond with me directly. And Prabhupada wrote a very strong letter saying that, we don't want this centralization. He said, the purpose of management is a very beautiful letter he wrote to Mukund Maharaj. And he said, the purpose of management and administration is to inspire the spirit of service in the devotees. That is the whole purpose. Different devotees have, have different inclinations, different inspirations, and management is meant to facilitate that. <coughs> so sometimes we find that certain man managerial structures can help in <coughs> can help in more and more devotees serving nicely. But sometimes some social structures, some manual structures can come in the way of devotee serving nicely. So then, if, if that's happening, then that devotee and the management have to decide how best can I serve. So our purpose should be to serve Krishna, to connect with Krishna. And yes, structures are important. Prabhupada also said in one of his last conversations with Giriraj Maharaj that the Krishna Conscious Movement will spread by organization and intelligence. So he didn't want us to be organized. But the organization is meant to facilitate the service to Krishna. It is not meant to obstruct the service to Krishna. It is not meant to uh, uh, discourage people. So whatever social structure we may have in our society, the purpose should be that everybody should be facilitated in their service of Krishna. And if a particular structure a devotee finds this is not really helping me in the service of Krishna, then the devotee may just distance themselves from that social structure and serve Krishna directly. That's also fine. It's not that um, no, service to Krishna is not limited to a particular social structure or a particular, in, a particular apparatus. The service to Krishna can be done in many different ways. And in fact, the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma and Parityaja Mamekam Sharanam Raja. No, that can be applied here. Ultimately, Dharma is what? It's some kind of social structure. Krishna is telling that, Arjuna, you have this Dharma, that, that, that. don't worry about that. Focus on surrendering to me. So we have to have social structures for efficient functioning. But at the same time, we have to have those social structures which lead to efficient functioning, which lead to greater service to Krishna. Not that establishing the social structure itself becomes such a big burden and that creates so much uh, conflict and tension that devotees become disheartened in their service to Krishna. So we have a hierarchy, but the purpose of the hierarchy is that everybody is meant to connect with Krishna through their service attitude. And that connection with Krishna is not dependent on one's position in the hierarchy. Anybody can connect with Krishna, anybody can become absorbed in Krishna, and somebody at the lower lungs of a hierarchy may actually go back to Krishna much earlier than somebody at the top level of the hierarchy also. Does that answer the question? Uh, partly. I, think, I don't think we really have time to elaborate more because it's, I want to take another question from the audience. I was more thinking in terms of how in the Sangha of devotees, the predominating uh, mood of interaction is that one, one wants to be the lowest. One actually takes pleasure in being the most junior and serving others. That I'll talk tomorrow. You know, that okay. how lower is higher yeah. in bhakti. That we'll talk about right. tomorrow. So, Shall we stop here? Maybe if Mother Nidra wants to say something. The, the senior. Okay. You had a question? I just wanted to clarify and maybe ask a question based on this point, Prabhu. Thank you for class. 
Um, so you said that um, we, there may be some external, there may be, we may be engaged in activities in bhakti and we may be attached to the result. Hmm. And I was, you said that the, the primary point is to, you know, the result may not be in our favor. May, we may be engaged in preaching for a long, long time and there may be, may be no one coming. But you said that the important part is our own internal um, yeah. development. So I was going to ask the question, how do we become convinced uh, or what can you say to us to help us to understand that the internal development of our own relationship with the Lord is the most important aspect? Because sometimes we get caught up in, okay. um, you know, the externals, like whether people are coming or like how many books I'm distributing or things like that. That's true. So we often give emphasis on externals, like how many people come for programs, or how many books are distributed. So how, how can we understand that? The internal growth is most important. See, again, we don't have to completely divorce the external and the internal. We have both kind of statements from our acharyas. Now, our previous acharyas have said, and Prabhupada would quote, that a Vaishnava is known by how many Vaishnavas they make. Mm -hmm. So, the potency of a devotee is seen. If you're really exalted devotee, you should attract people and make them devotees. But in Prabhupada also said, in other places, that we are selling diamonds. You will never see a crowd outside a diamond shop. And Prabhupada said, you know, one star, one moon is better than a thousand stars. So Prabhupada did not really, uh, Prabhupada would uh, defend the fact that not many people will come by saying that we are offering a high quality. So both are there. Yes, a devotee will preach purely, and the devotee's preach purely, which may attract a lot of people. But sometimes it may not happen like that. So there are so many factors involved which you just don't know. In our moment also, we may have some spiritual masters who are thousands of disciples. Some people may have few disciples, some may be very exalted, but may not have any disciples. So it's just the number of disciples is not the necessary criteria by which you can say who's how spiritually advanced. We respect them definitely. They are doing great service to Srila Prabhupada's mission. But the point is, uh, we cannot just fixate only on the externals. At the same time, uh, the externals are also important because we want to serve Krishna in this world. Mm. You know, we want to serve Krishna by making contribution in this world. Krishna descends, dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavam yogi yogi. He descends to establish dharma and as his devotees, we want to assist him in establishing dharma. Now what differentiated Prabhupada from many of his god brothers mm -hmm. in the Gaudiya Mat was that Prabhupada had a driving, burning conviction the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said the holy name will be chanted in every town and village and it is my responsibility to make the prophecy come true. So we want results in this world also. But we want them to offer them to Krishna. So if the results come, we will offer them to Krishna. If the results don't come, in our endeavoring for the results, we have offered our consciousness to Krishna. And that itself is an important offering also. So, so the it's ideally how it works is the internal and the external are symbiotic. That I am so happy in bhakti that when I share bhakti with others, people see, oh, you're so happy. I want to know what makes you tick. And they also come. Mm -hmm. And so if our inner joyfulness in bhakti attracts people to come to bhakti. And people's coming to bhakti externally also increases our conviction. Yes, Krishna is there. Krishna is helping me. And that increases our inner connection with Krishna, that increases our inner joyfulness. So the internal and the external can be symbiotic. And that's how they should be ideally. But sometimes they can be exclusive. Sometimes external success can be a way for us to cover up our lack of inner success. And so I am not remembering Krishna. So during chanting, I don't look at how nicely I am chanting. I look at who all else is sleeping. I point them out, point them out, point them out. But sometimes our external success, if it becomes a substitute for inner success. Means I don't get any taste in bhakti, therefore I need taste somewhere. So I become the number one book distributor. And then people praise me, then I feel I'm doing something worthwhile. So it's ultimately we have to see you know, in the devotional activities how much am I getting satisfaction. We may not get ecstatic satisfaction, but at least some taste we are getting. So then ideally the external and internal should be symbiotic. 
And sometimes if the externals don't come, we need to get discouraged. Because there's so many factors involved. She said, internally, if I'm connected with Krishna, I will be satisfied. There's a letter of Srila Prabhupada to one of his Mataji disciples. Now, she had a lot of difficulty, a lot of reversals. And Prabhupada said, we don't get discouraged because we work on a different platform. We work on the platform of internally connecting with Krishna. So even if external results don't come, we don't get discouraged. But of course, we want the results and we strive for the results. And if they come, we are grateful. We offer them to Krishna. Thank you very much. Shri Chaitanya Charitamrit ki, Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhaktavind ki, Jai Gaur Premanandi. Huh?